Today, we have the pleasure of welcoming Mahina Kaohi, a Leeward Community College graduate and University of Hawaii West Oahu student. Mahina is a writing consultant at Leeward Community College's Writing Center, co-founder of the Creative Writing Club, and is a writer and poet. Mahina's creative work will be featured by Ho'olana Publishing. Mahina Kauhi shares why science fiction is a popular genre for today's writers, how the literary community in Hawaii is supportive, and a positive message that writer's block may not exist. Join us in a space for creativity. Welcome to the Reading Room. a lot of characters and their setting is in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, How would you describe your work? What do you write about? That's a great question. Um, I think I tend towards writing about moving a lot. So my family moved around a lot. Um, a lot of transitional stages, a lot of transitory periods. So I end up writing about what upheaval feels like a lot. Um, and I've also been able to acquaint myself with different areas around the island. So um, just understanding the different like character essences of each setting and like the different economic and like social and financial things that play into where people live um, has been like a big topic in my writing. I also grew up in like a really religious community, so I love exploring religion in my writing um, as well. Oh, that's so great. Uh, I noticed that you have um, a lot of influences in your work. Mm -hmm. So do you have any authors or any specific events um, that influences your work? I have a, an author that I really admire. She's um, a Hawaiian Jewish author. Her name is T. Kira Madden and she wrote the memoir Long Live the Tribe of Fatherless Girls. Um, when I read that a few years ago, uh, it was really it was really profound. It also kind of showed me what memoir can be. Um, it's like a little bit, when I thought of memoir before an autobiography, I always thought about things being linear, um, but that is not how memory functions. Um, and that's also not how writing has to function. So that really helped me understand not only what creative nonfiction can be or like what memoir can be, but also what writing in general can be. Wow, you know, I, I love how you're, the, the way you say that, that you think of the various genres, you know, and your different approaches uh, to those genres. And I know like you're, you're an amazing poet, uh, but you write uh, fiction, you know, short stories. And I was wondering, um, do you have any, um, or do you have a favorite poem or story? Um, so I have a piece that I worked on throughout my previous semester. It's called Extinction. Um, it's a creative, fiction piece about a boy named Archie whose twin brother dies. Um, and when they're little, they're both like huge dinosaur fans um, as kids can be like, you know, especially as like boys, like they really love dinosaurs. And when his brother passes away, he passes away pretty young. Um, I filter Archie's grief through the metaphor of the mass extinction event. Um, so I tried to juxtapose the idea of grief being like this huge, like, fiery moment um, where the world is tr like it changes in that immediate like it changes immediately and then also uh, how the mass ex extinction event lasted a long long time so when the meteor hits the earth it throws up a bunch of soil into the sky and then photosynthesis stops and then like because photosynthesis stop, plants aren't thriving, um, the animals aren't thriving, um, and then everything like slowly dies. Um, and I was thinking about how grief can be like that, like it's a huge moment, but it's also so long. Um, and that's kind of what that piece centers upon. Wow, that's amazing. Uh, do you mind reading uh, some of your work? Yeah, of course. Um, so sorry. Uh, throughout this piece, I kind of put scenes of Archie's life and what he's dealing with, um, with his grief. Um, and then I also insert information about the extinction event. So this is a paragraph from about the mass extinction event. 
So, American physicist Louis Alvarez theorized that the mass extinction event, also known as the KPG extinction, was caused by an asteroid colliding with the Earth. It slammed through layers of metamorphic rock, growling through rigid beds of sediment and melting boulders as it bent the world around its hellish body. The impact thrust thick clouds of rock into the sky that blackened the atmosphere. The stars that shone with the promise of eternity blinked out like lights going off in a building. The temperatures sank, photosynthesis stopped, and the plants died, and then all the animals died too. It's a myth that the mass extinction event, um, the mass extinction of the dinosaurs was a vivid pyrolytic moment. It lasted thousands of years, that slow death in the dark. And wow. that's kind of like yeah, one of the excerpts from that. Oh, wow, that's, that's amazing. I, I know like there's a lot of um, scientific references in yes. your work. Do, do you, um, I, I know a lot of times we try to be authentic, mm. you know, in our stories. And uh, a lot of times uh, to have that authenticity, uh, we have research. Well, what is your process as you uh, learn more about your topic uh, as you write? Um, so when it comes to writing, I usually approach uh, research topics in two ways. So I'll approach it from a like systemic standpoint. Um, so what are the big factors that go into this event, like my story? So this is where I start looking at like economy. This is where I start looking at like the social issues that impact the characters. This is where I look at the setting. Um, this is where I look about like the scientific research that goes into like the mass extinction, for example. Um, and then after I finished like doing the big research and looking at the, the factors as they relate to like huge moving pieces, I start looking at individual characters um, and how people like process things on their own. So for this piece, for example, I'm doing research on what, cause I'm not a scientist. I did not know that much about the, the extinction of the dinosaurs before this. Um, but I was looking at information um, on the physicist that kind of discovered this. And then when it came to like Archie's feelings and how I would thread that metaphor through his grief, uh, I looked at people who like had dealt with the death of a sibling and like personal accounts. Um, this is where like my love of memoir kind of comes into play. Um, I love seeing people render uh, the things that they've gone through because I don't, when it comes to accuracy and like what people feel, um, I think the personal accounts are best uh, versus like a more kind of distant academic approach. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of how I approach things. Big things and then how like personal accounts and how they affect individuals. Wow, yeah. I, I love how you mentioned uh, it's uh, grounded in research, but then you also have that personal aspect of it and it's very human in, in your stories. And uh, and I was wondering, you know, we, we talked about research um, and authenticity, but I know you also write in uh, not only um, standard English, but um, Olelo Hawaii, right? And also um, Hawaii Creole English of Pidgin, right? Um, how do you keep authentic authenticity within the languages? Um, when it comes to Olelo um, and also Hawaiian Creole or like Pigeon, um, I tend to write characters from what I know. So I try to be as true to myself, especially in creative like nonfiction pieces. I want to reflect the language that I've been given, the language that I can share. Um, but there are definitely experiences outside of myself. Like I'm not fluent in Olelo. So when I write characters, even if they're not speaking Olelo Hawaii in their, um, in the piece, I still want to reflect the experience of someone who can and does. Um, and so language is not just like how you're using the words, but also like the culture and the personality that comes as a result of implementing that language and using it every day. So I try to take that into consideration when I'm like writing anyone, but also especially writing like authentically. Oh, I, I, I like how you mentioned it's important in uh, representation and mm -hmm. making sure that it's accurate, you know, for, for the reader to experience. And yeah, you know, I, I noticed you also mentioned that you also talk about personal experiences. And I know like, you know, we, we always ask authors, you know, is there something that you would would write about and also what you wouldn't write about? So is there something that you would not really write about? Hmm. I think when it comes to things that I would not write about, uh, it's experiences that I don't feel I fully processed. I know that writing can be a tool by which to process things, um, but sometimes that writing is just personal. Sometimes it's journal writing. Sometimes it's just a short story that you uh, kind of build yourself to work things out. Um, 
So when it comes to what I would write about, I think I'd write about anything, whether or not I'd disclose it is a different story. Um, there are also issues that I feel as though, even if I've experienced them, I don't feel equipped to present them in a way that feels fair um, or like takes into account other people's experiences. So even being cognizant of that, the idea that I don't have the full scope or the equipment or the tools to address those things confidently and with enough grace and generosity where I am taking other people's perspectives into account, I will usually not write about that. I, I love how you uh, t try to um, represent um, fairly, you know, your stories. And there's also that question and that uh, difference between uh, writing uh, for expression versus writing for publication. And it, it's OK to write for expression. And publication, you can think of later, you know, whether or not the audience is just for you um, and to release it or for everyone to see. You know, that was, that's amazing. I was wondering, because I know you have experience, right, uh, teaching writing, helping students with, with their writing as well. Uh, what is your writing process when, when you come up either with a, an, a story or a poem? Is it different depending on what type of writing you have? And what is your process? Yeah, so I really like earlier how you talked a little bit about poetry and also like short fiction. Um, with poetry, I feel as though I really admire poets. I also admire songwriters because they have to be very succinct. Um, so when it comes to poetry, I think about it like gem cutting. You have to be very, very close to the verse um, and very, very close in the lines. When it comes to like novella or like short fiction, um, I tend to compare it more to like sculpture or maybe like, mar like marble sculpture. So you have a bunch of marble and then you just have to take the chisel and after a long, long time, you'll have, you'll have something. Eventually you'll have something. Um, but when it comes to like poetry, because it's so like, you have to be so precise. Um, that's what I think more about with like gem cutting. Oh, I love that. I love that metaphor <laughs> of, of gem cutting. And I can visually see you, you know, working on a, a creative piece as, as a poem or a story. And by the way, I, I loved hearing your uh, story. Uh, could, could, do you have another one that you could share with us? Yes. OK, thank you so much for asking. I have a creative nonfiction piece um, called The Violent Miracle. It talks about my time like growing up in Wahiwa. Um, we moved around a lot. We were kind of unsure about where what our housing was going to look like. Um, and so I would often talk to my dad or my dad would talk to us about like, you know, praying and being religious and like keeping faith so that something good would happen to us. And throughout the story, there is a time where like this giant, this giant bulldog comes down the mountain while I'm walking my dogs. And I am so scared because it's this giant bulldog and I have nothing to defend myself. I'm like 16 years old. Um, and I'm like, okay, well, please, I don't want to have to deal with this. Um, I don't know what to do, so like I pray. And then this car comes out of nowhere and it smears the dog like across the road. Um, and that's kind of like, it's a very violent miracle. Like it's a miracle, but it's violent. Um, and so this piece kind of explores a little bit about um, what it means to be in like very like despairing situations and what kind of things need to happen or what kind of things need to come to pass to get out of them. Um, so this like is an excerpt from here. Uh, so family prayer, my father calls and my brothers and I saunter out of our rooms to meet him on the chilly ceramic of our living room floor. My mother smelling lightly of garlic powder and dust and sweat, dust flecks of chopping, uh, dust flecks of chopped vegetables from her apron and folds her arms. My brothers and I follow suit. Who would like to give the prayer? My father looks from face to sheepish face and sees no volunteers. He grunts, then I'll say it. When we gather in a circle like this, we pray for miracles. Eight hour work days, a key to unshackle us from debt, another month without eviction, Christmas presents. Most of all, we pray for eyes to see and ears to hear the Lord's guidance in our lives. My father is the patron saint of Uber drivers and McDonald's parking lot dinners. He is an intercessor on our sinful behalf, communing with God about our electricity bill. How will we pay, my mother frets, shivering with unbelief. My father explains to me often that doubt is her greatest flaw. I inherited her gender. I do not want to inherit her other shortcomings, though I am beginning to question my father's judgment. He bows his head and says, I won't know until it happens, but we will pay. I am terrified by his faith. It emphasizes the meagerness of my own. And that's oh, yeah. 
You know, I'm, I'm so glad that you mentioned um, faith. And I was wondering, um, do you tend to, because um, uh, I, I know there's a lot of writers where uh, a lot of times they use um, their knowledge of their religion and they have that as uh, uh, either a theme or a topic um, that their the characters kind of <laughs> um, use. Um, what, do, do you do that in your work? And is that something that uh, you, you like to do? Yeah, so I do like writing about religion from different perspectives. So people who have been, or like characters who have been in religion for a really long time, characters who maybe carry it for like their parents' sake, characters who carry it for their children's sake, um, people who are bound uh, to religion, religion through their families, people who like find comfort um, and guidance through it. Um, so I like kind of measuring all these different perspectives. I did grow up uniquely Christian. So I do have like a Christian perspective um, versus like so many other different religions. Um, and there's like such a diversity. Um, and that's kind of how I approach my writing. Yeah, religion in my writing. Yeah, because I, I know, um, like like we were talking about, there's a lot of writers who, who do include religion, mm -hmm. you know, in their writing and um, how the characters relate to that uh, religion as well. So it's like, wow, very um, uh, interesting. Uh, and a lot of um, thought-provoking themes can come out of out of that as well. Yeah. Wow. Um, I, I notice that sometimes um, there's uh, political aspects in your poetry, you know, that, that you mentioned earlier about you, you write about uh, a topic, you know, especially when it uh, when it's um, when you feel strongly about mm -hmm. it as well. Um, I, I know. Well, what is your your themes in terms of your um, th types of um, political writing? So when it comes to political writing, um, I think that everything kind of affects each other. So like class, um, where you feel you belong, like ethnically, um, race, um, faith, religion. Um, and I guess one example would be like, I have a character and um, they are called to like observe the Sabbath essentially. So they shouldn't do anything that's like not related to church, but because of like how they're doing economically, they can't afford to like honor like the Sabbath as they might like as others might. So I think it also like discusses, um, a lot of my political writing kind of discusses the intersections of like class and culture and like faith um, and what it means to be able to perform correctly um, in those spheres. Um, also, uh, a lot of political writing is like queer. Um, so I try to incorporate that into my writing as well. Um, in like various different ways. Yeah, because because I know like I, I know you mentioned um, uh, the, there's I noticed that there was a sci-fi kind of nature in your 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 first you know about like a the meteor and you know like a, a type of a, a reality. Yeah. You know, uh, but also um, I can see that you know there's a lot of um, queer writing you know that is uh, prominent uh, during this time uh, period. Yeah. Yeah. How, how do you see yourself um, in that? Um, with other writers, um, similar writers? So there is a series called The Locked Tomb um, by um, Tamsin Mirror, I think. Um, and it's like very sci-fi, it's very queer. It like talks uh, about a little bit about religion. Well, actually a lot about religion. Um, and all these themes are like threaded into one series. Um, and I like the idea of kind of playing with a bunch of different, um, bunch of really important political issues through the genre of sci-fi because sci-fi is historically very political um, so I do appreciate sci-fi for that fact and I do want to emulate other sci-fi writers because I feel as though there's so much writing there's so much sci-fi writing that you can do and that has been done um, that is political and I would argue that the genre is inher inherently political um, which is why I'm often um, maybe not bored isn't the word, um, but uh, sci-fi writing that doesn't incorporate political um, political aspects or doesn't make any meaningful commentary um, on political things, uh, I do find it disappointing. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. You know, you know that, that's a good point when you mentioned sci-fi, because it's sci-fi, it sounds like, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, like it, it has e your own world mm. that it, it's, um, it's easy to make it poetic or um, it's kind of like political because it's kind of making a statement on this world that is being created, mm -hmm. um, that, that 
um, in writing and um, the audience can uh, relate to as well. Is that, is that how you feel? Yeah, so sci-fi, definitely. You have to craft a lot of your own world. You have to do a lot of world building in sci-fi. Same with dystopian um, novels, dystopian fiction, like The Hunger Games, for example. Um, when it comes to sci-fi and dystopia, you really have to have a grasp of it has to be grounded in reality. So even though you're crafting your own world, you have to have a strong understanding of like how politics works in like works in the real world um, to produce a meaningful critique, a meaningful social critique. Um, so sometimes it's daunting to write things for those genres, um, but at the essence of these like fantastical genres is something very human. Um, and I think being able to tell those stories is impressive. So those are the writers that I seek to emulate. Yeah, you know, it's so, I, I love how you, you know, describe and talk about sci-fi and that genre, because it, is it, it sounds like it's really popular, especially nowadays. <laughs> well, why do you think it's popular during this time? That's a really great question. Um, I think that people are, hopefully people at large are becoming more aware of like, you know, the circumstances that they find themselves in, the political circumstances that they, you know, that we participate in um, and that we also find ourselves in um, and recognizing those themes um, as things come to a head, I think, uh, just gets easier, I think, uh, hopefully. That's how I approach science fiction and also um, dystopian fiction today. I, I love how you mentioned um, the the times now yeah because i know it's a very political climate at this time and uh, there's a lot of um uh concern about the preservation of rights mm -hmm. yeah so yeah do, do you think that's part of it as well i do and it's also not like things haven't always been political um but i think that awareness is maybe spreading a little bit more rapidly um and the more people learn about the world and the more people um, understand about how things function um, and how we, what context we exist in, uh, the more we'll be able to connect with stories like, you know, dystopian fiction and science fiction. I know that a lot of different um, novels that I liked as a child that I thought were like, oh, that's cool. Um, I would return to them and I would think, wow, this is like a really powerful allegory um, to like this, or this is a really interesting deconstruction about the pageantry of like war and violence. Um, like for example, like the Hunger Games when I was 12, I was like, ooh, cool. Um, I'm still like, ooh, cool. But now I'm like, okay, wow, this is actually very effective political commentary. Wow. Uh, but yeah. So great, wow. Um, now, I, I know this topic comes up when you help students and um, I know some some writers are really afraid of writer's block mm. <laughs> and they're always looking for that cure. Uh, what is your cure for writer's block? That is a fantastic question. And that's really funny because I asked one of my professors at West the same thing. Um, and he said, with due respect, I don't think writer's block exists. And I was like, I don't know, like that, I thought that it's such a prevalent concept and it's so widely shared that it has to exist. And he said, um, if you have thoughts, like everyone is thinking thoughts, so just write it. <laughs> um, and I found that so funny. Um, but I also found him to be correct um, in some aspects. When I would do writing, I think there is a pressure to put something on the page that's good. Um, and so those days when I have trouble writing, I think, am I more scared of, like, am I scared? I'm, I'm, do I feel scared about writing today? And if I feel as though I want to do better, uh, that I want to just do, then I'm gonna have trouble that day. I'm like, if I if I care so much about my first draft being something substantial, um, I won't be able to make a first draft. So whenever I'm writing, I think, you know, like I'm, I'm thinking things right now, so I might as well put them on the page. And like we were kind of talking earlier about like, um, writing for me is often about having this giant block of marble and chiseling it. So if I don't have the marble, I can't chisel anything. <laughs> Um, so even if you put a block of text on the page and even if it's garbage, and it will be very often garbage. Um, I've put so many things on the page that it's just nonsense. Um, but, you know, after you have that nonsense, you can refine it into something that is substantial and is what you wanted. Wow. 
Wow, I, I love that. I love that metaphor about the marble and then you're um, actually the, the sculptor, you know, <laughs> creating your own work. Yeah. And also, I, I love the fact that, you know, like, you know, there was mention about there's always something to say, mm -hmm. you know, and it's that writer's block may not exist. And it's just a case where because I know like a lot of writers, they kind of you know, put too much pressure mm. on, on themselves and get, they get more nervous and then they're like, oh, and it's like, this is not good enough. And yeah. that, do, do you think like kind of removing that critical eye or that critical mind might help? Or? Yeah, and I think it's very difficult because when you characterize yourself as a writer, if you can't put out art that sustains your self-concept, it's depressing. <laughs> like, you know, you put it, you're like, oh, am I, am I a writer? Like, is this even good? And like, for me, like 85% of the time, it is not. Um, and so like you have to confront that again and again, like I am a writer because I write. I'm not a writer because I'm this everything I put out is going to be good. Um, so but distancing, putting distance between yourself and that critical that the critic inside of you um, enough to produce work. It's difficult. Yeah. It's something you have to do every day. Oh, yeah. I, I love the fact that there's the two parts, the creative side, but the, the critical side and just, just kind of let yourself write yeah. without kind of discounting, you know, <laughs> yourself or having that other voice exactly. come in. Like in the drafting process, I try to keep my creative in the room and the critic out. And then when it comes to like refining, when it comes to revision and editing, I'm like, okay, critic can come back in. Like, this is where I actually need it. Oh, yeah. good advice. Yeah, thank you. Um, now, I know there's a lot of writers, you know, who look um, for advice, you know, they want to be a writer, mm -hmm. you know, um, they want to be published. Uh, what if someone tells you, I want to be a writer, how, how do I do it? And how do I get published? Well, what advice do you have for them? Um, I think when I was asking those questions, and I often am asking those questions to this day, like, how can I be a writer? How can I get my work out there? Um, it is usually a confidence thing. So what I usually like tell people is you have more profound ideas and observations about the world than you think you do. Um, you're always making connections. If they don't exist in your conscious mind, they exist in your subconscious mind. Um, so when it comes to that, I say like you have something unique to say about the world and you experience, you, you live in the context, in a context, and you understand things about that context. And the things you articulate about that context are gonna be meaningful because they're real. Um, when it comes to like getting published, I would say um, just making sure that you are okay with rejection um, and that you can still value yourself um, as you're like pitching to people and as you're finding a home for your ideas. Um, and it is largely about um, the home for your ideas. So when you're looking at publications, like, does this, does this organization represent things that I would like to be a part of? Like, do they speak to maybe politics that I feel strongly about? Um, are they full of people that I respect, writers that I wish to emulate, or even like peers or people who I want to be my peers? Um, so when it comes to publication, that's also one of my pieces of advice. Um, when it comes to like how, how to actually get writing, you just have to do it. You just have to make the time. Um, and this is something I constantly tell myself too. Um, like, wow, I wish I could write. Like you can, and you should, um, like you have to take that time for yourself. You have to make it. Um, but yeah, that's kind of my advice. Oh, well, a lot of good advice. Cause I know sometimes students will get a rejection letter and they're like, oh no, I'm not good. And then they start doubting themselves, but it could be that they might've just sent it to a publisher that wasn't, you know, yeah. a good match. And maybe they should like send it to a different publisher and yeah. try and might get accepted. Yeah. Oh, that's Exactly. Great. Yeah. And there've been so many places where I've like submitted something and they'd be like, this isn't for us. And that's totally okay yeah. because I'll send it to other places and they'll be like, yeah, this is a pl this belongs within the context of our magazine or our publication. And that also feels really good. Yeah. Wow. Thank you so much. Oh, my goodness. You, you've you've given us so much information in terms of um, helping, you know, new writers and to give them the confidence to write. And yeah. And um, thank you so much, Mahina Kaohi, <laughs> for you joining us so in the reading room. And thank you so much for everyone for joining us for another episode of The Reading Room.